The title of this message is The Rest of Christmas, and we're going to uh, kind of go as we have been, stanza by stanza, through uh, the Christmas carol, Joy to the World. And um, Joy to the World is written by uh, a man named Isaac Watts. It would be hard for us to even uh, calculate the incredible impact that he has made on the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, Watts was for many years a Methodist minister and is uh, kind of like if you think of Matt Redman and Chris Tomlin together, um, in his day he was that prolific of a hymn writer. Um, about 750 uh, hymns that he wrote were uh, commonly sung and distributed. He was born July the 17th, six, get this, 1674. Not 17 or 18. Isaac Watts, 1674, barely 100 years after the Reformation, uh, after the life of Martin Luther and so on. Uh, he was a nonconformist, which means that he uh, saw many of the doctrinal emphasis in the Church of England as problematic, and he was twice jailed uh, for his resistance to some of the non biblical, more ritualistic uh, emphases of the uh, Church of England. Um, he lived uh, 38 years in good health, but at 38 years of age, his health was shattered by, a, quote, a violent continuous fever from which he never truly recovered. Uh, he left the pastorate at 38 years of age and was taken in by a patron family uh, who supported him until he uh, passed into eternity at the age of 74, 1748. Uh, here's a statue of Isaac Watts at... Uh, Westminster Abbey. Uh, so, of course, that's the church right in the heart of London where the Queen is married. It's, 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 um, it just shows how highly thought of he uh, really is. As, as a child, Isaac Watts was such a prodigy that it was said that he spoke in rhymes. He just would rhyme his sentences and was so given to that that at one point his uh, father was disciplining him to try to get him to stop speaking constantly in rhymes. And he's uh, reported to have said, Oh, Father, um, oh, Father, pity take, and I will no more verses make. <laughs> Some of his most famous hymns are... Um, O oh God, our help in ages past. From Isaac Watts' pen comes, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. He's also uh, known for this verse. I love this hymn. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing uh, seas abroad and filled the lofty skies. Lord, how thy wisdoms are displayed where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. And maybe most... Uh, famous from Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that would be a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Well, it's that Isaac Watts uh, that published in 1719 the Christmas carol, uh, Joy to the World. Uh, by most estimates, it's the most commonly uh, sung uh, Christmas carol uh, in the world today. And because in Isaac Watts' day, the late 1600s, it was considered uh, in many places sacrilegious uh, to sing anything other than the songbook of the Bible, um, Watts uh, based many of his hymns upon specific scriptures. So if you would open your Bible to Psalm 98, the, the Christmas carol, Joy to the World, <coughs> comes from uh, Psalm 98. 
And I've kind of written a long sentence here, uh, which will take us through the entire uh, message of the carol, uh, pointing out its uh, consistency with the Word of God. And hopefully, as our series title indicates, uh, singing uh, Christmas, singing our way right into uh, the joyful celebration and worship that our newborn Savior is due. So start here. Uh, the first uh, words of the carol, actually the hymn, uh, the, the tune uh, was adapted from uh, a uh, primarily written by Handel, but adapted by a guy named Lowell Mason uh, in 1839, uh, the, that tune that we were just singing. So here it is, the first verse of the carol. Uh, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. I think a good summary there would be this. Uh, prepare to welcome the Lord our king. Pre that's Christmas, isn't it? Are you working on that? As you buzz about and plan meals and wrap presents, uh, prepare to welcome uh, the Lord our King. You'll see it here in Psalm 98 that we've opened our Bibles to. Verse 1 says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Watts apparently felt the freedom uh, to shuffle the order of the text, and so the hymn's themes are not specific to the order of Psalm 98, uh, but it actually is uh, all there. And uh, it's not real specific until he, uh, he's not even called the king until verse 6 of Psalm 98, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. There it is. Actually, what's interesting is, is those who study these matters, I wasn't aware that people studied uh, Christmas carols the way they do, but I know now. And one of the things that they said about this was that Watts never intended this to even be a Christmas carol. That in reality, when you, they say, when you look at the words of the Christmas carol, it's talking more about the second advent of Christ as king than it is, in even, is even actually talking about his first advent. Now, we've talked about this before, how the uh, writers in the Old Testament were looking across the uh, mountain peaks of Scripture and how, uh, from the Old Testament perspective, it actually, as they looked, they could just see the peaks. And many of the prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament grouped together things about him as Savior, things about him as King. And this is why the disciples were so confused when they would come to Jesus and said, Lord, when are you going to bring in the kingdom? When are you going to take over? Where's all the perfect justice that was promised? And of course, now we understand that the Old Testament prophets couldn't see the gap between his first advent when he came as Savior and his second advent, this is going to be a great spot for an amen, and his second advent when he'll come again as king. Amen. Right? So um, um, a good summary of this whole message would be, the first Christmas that we're celebrating this week should cause us always to be mindful of the fact that the rest of Christmas, we don't have it yet. And uh, theologians call this the now and the not yet. And what we have in Christ's first advent gives us confidence that the part's not fulfilled yet a perfect justice, the righting of every wrong, a perfect kingdom, an eternal state. Not yet. But Christmas reminds us that the God who kept the first half of those promises is still going to keep them. I'm not sure, though, why they say that this isn't a Christmas carol. Honestly, I see so much of Christmas in it. It was Spurgeon who observed that many of the words in Psalm 98 parallel perfectly um, Mary's Magnificat. Do you know what that is? That's the song that Mary 
celebrated when she came uh, bearing the Christ child and saw her cousin Elizabeth. And Elizabeth reported that John the Baptist, within her womb, leaped for joy that Mary and the Christ child. And of course, we know where all of that goes in the Gospels. But upon that happening, Mary burst forth into verse and just compare the words of Psalm 98 to what Mary worshiped in Luke 1. Psalm 98 from David. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. And from Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord. From David, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, for he has done marvelous things. And from Mary, just weeks away from Christ's birth, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. From David, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of nations. And from Mary, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And from David, he has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. And from Mary, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. No, I think the Christmas themes here are immense. Joy to the world. Let me ask, is that what the world needs? The joy of Christ, the joy of Christmas, and all that that means? Is there a greater need? Now, keep in mind, as we often say, that joy isn't happiness. If you think that joy is happiness, you're not going to have a lot of joy because every time something torpedoes your happiness boat, you can still have joy. Without question, there's people, maybe I'm looking at some of them, I'm sure, who are actually very heavy-hearted right now. And the, the burden of getting to a place of, of, of rejoicing at Christmas is upon you because the circumstances are shouting, you have nothing to rejoice about. But let's separate out circumstantial happiness. Comes and goes, comes and goes. It's okay to say I'm not thrilled with my circumstances right now. It's okay to see happiness drifting away. There are good days and bad days. There are sunny days and there are rainy days. But joy is for every day. Joy says, I know who I am and I know whose I am and I know how this ends. Amen. And I believe it. And my joy is rooted in that. And I will not give it up, not for anything, not for anyone. And so when we sing, please hear me, loved ones, and I do love you dearly. When we sing joy to the world, we are not saying happiness to the world. The world is running headlong into the pursuit of what we all know to be very fleeting. It's an alternative that we offer. Not an upgrade, not the totality, not happiness all the way to the finish line. And joy is so much greater than that. What a great way to begin a Christmas song. Joy to the world. And can there be any joy where the sentence doesn't finish? The Lord has come. Is there better news? Is there anything that could change everything more than that one solitary life? This happened. You know, so much as a preacher, you're always talking about, it's going to be, I just was doing it a minute ago, someday, 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 this happened. This already happened, and it is shouting that everything that hasn't happened yet will happen just as surely. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Awesome. The creator of all came to earth and saved us from our sin. But I cannot say us, not honestly. I have to pause as the carol does and say, is this for you? It's available to everyone, but it is not the possession of everyone because the carol rightly says, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth Next word, receive her king. And we know that some will and some won't. And that's why John 1, 12 gives us this incredible distinction. Look at this verse. But to all who did receive him, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. No, you have to make it personal. Let earth receive, receive her king. Have you done that? He, he gets even more specific. Do you remember the next line? Let every heart prepare him room. Only you can do this. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be awesome? How many people think it'd be awesome if you could believe for every member of your family? I mean, all in favor, right? Would you vote for that? Wouldn't that be great? But the, one, one of the things that dispenses our, our uh, happiness and reduces us to the glorious granite of our joy is that we can't do this for anyone else. And God is wrestling with hearts today. And we pray as parents, as sisters, as children, as we think of our loved ones, some of whom we'll share a meal with this week, others of whom we'll have a longing phone call with. And with it, the prayer, always let every heart prepare him room. How's that not an allusion to Christmas? Right? I don't know why they say this doesn't have Christmas in it. I remember, I said this to Kathy last night. You know, Kathy comes from a family. Her mother watches Walking the Word on TV every day now. I'm, I'm still like her second or third favorite, but she watches it all the time now. And, and, and uh, she loves the Lord. But Kathy didn't grow up going to church. She didn't know anything about any of this. She doesn't have like I have. How many people have childhood remembers, memories of hearing the Christmas story told? Put up your hand if you have that. And then, now put up your hand. I don't have that. Put up your hand. I don't have it. That's awesome, yeah? And, and so um, you, this is good because you're not spoiled by what I'm about to say. So I remember um, very uh, earnest, earnest um, uh, storytellers in children's ministry um, making a huge deal about Mary uh, riding with Joseph on a donkey. First of all, the Bible doesn't mention the donkey, okay? All these things we have in this Christmas story that aren't in the Bible. No donkey mentioned. It was 70 to 80 miles, a woman of her age. And in that part of the world, they may have walked over two or three days. We don't know. But anyway, the donkey's in the story. I don't want to ruin it for you. You can imagine a donkey. The Bible doesn't say either way. But, but this is one thing the Bible does say. And I think it's uh, Luke chapter 1 or something or 2, 27. Somebody check me on this. I, was gonna, I got super busy this week. I, I didn't have this part of the sermon finished. But... It says, and she wrapped the babe in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was, do you know? No room in the inn. No room in the inn. And, and I, I can remember an energetic Sunday school teacher, you know, no room, you know? And I picture Mary, you know, she's big old Mary. She's up on this donkey and she's... The, the, we, and she, they're riding into town. And I can remember my Sunday school teacher, you know, can you believe they, they knocked at one hotel after another and they went door to door. This is, he's really quite expanding on that little phrase. And, and I pictured, you know, this big innkeeper with a big apron going, no room in the inn, you know. And it's this massive, and then almost like the grim reaper pointing, you know, to the stable for all of you. And, 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 uh, I, I remember as a kid, this was like, to me, this was the biggest part of the whole Christmas story. And I was like, how could this happen? Who let this happen? Why was there no planning? Who, they should have called ahead. They, they should have booked a room. How could they not have a room? And, and, um, and as impossible as that sounds, that's predictable compared to the reality that people don't make room in their heart for Jesus Christ? The free gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of sins now and forever to all who will receive him? Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. It reminded me of the song, Have You Any Room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin. As he knocks and asks admission, sinner, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, king of glory. Hasten, now his word obey. Swing your heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. 
because it won't always be true, as Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, Jesus says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What an, what an offer. Prepare to welcome the Lord our King. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of nations. And then this. Prepare to welcome the Lord our King. It's just kind of an ongoing sentence. Employing every possible instrument. Anybody on the welcoming committee already knows how awesome Jesus is. And we want no dormant instruments. We want no silent voices. That's why Psalm 98 goes on to say, um, starting in verse 4, I'll come back to 3. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, which is kind of a harpy guitar sort of thing. Took me a long time to work up that definition. <laughs> Super descriptive, right? This harpy guitar sort of thing. You can't get that kind of stuff anywhere, people. I hope you appreciate that insight. And with the lyre and sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. And even on later, it, it's sing and clap your hands seven, eight, nine times in one song. Sing, music, noise, voice, sing, praise, play. Employing every possible instrument. Second verse of Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. See how that comes right out of Psalm 98. While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains. And Jesus says if they won't worship the very rocks and stones themselves will cry out. And as you wrestle with those who seem to have no room for Jesus, be comforted in the reality that the volume of adoration will not be lacking. The very creation itself will cry out in adoration of the Savior who is born. I love these exhortations to singing. You know that only Christians really sing, right? Do you understand this? Only Christians really sing. You say, well, I think Muslims sing. No, not really. No. I mean, they have that guy on the loudspeaker coercing everyone to prayer five times a day with some sort of melodramatic, oppressive chanting. But they don't get together and sing. By singing, I'm not talking about, you know, Beatles and Bob Hope and Bono and all that. I'm, I'm saying as an organization, as an institution, as a societal grouping of people, only Christians sing. Do Buddhists sing? Uh, no, they chant ritualistically, repetitive, pr repetitively. Do Hindus sing? Well, there is some uh, Indian uh, music actually in uh, Hinduism. Uh, they even have musical saints, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to the oceans, the rivers, the thousands upon thousands, the great songs of the ages, the great transitional styles in music through the centuries, all of it, all of it from Christ worshipers. Do atheists sing? They say that's a growing segment of society, atheists. What are their songs? Please send me uh, an email about the atheist songs that don't exist. <laughs> Does the Rotary Club sing? Are, are, they, are they working up a, a lot of uh, songs down there at the uh, American Legion? Are they, do they have a lot of songs? Do they? Well, they have the Star Spangled Banner written by a Christian, filled with allusions to faith. Only Christians sing, do you get it? I don't mean technically you can't come up with a contradiction. I'm saying when you look at the <clears throat> ocean of music worldwide, it is flowing from Christ followers. Does the National Organization of Women, are they putting out a lot of music? 
How about the American Association of Retired Persons? <laughs> that I'm not as willing to joke about as I once was. <laughs> are, are we getting a lot of, a lot of you just can't wait to get to those years where you're gonna start just tuning out, just, just all the music is coming, right? No, no, all the music is coming from the Christians. But note this, even Christians find it hard to sing sometimes. Here's when it's hard to sing. Make a note of it. First of all, it's hard to sing through unbelief. If you have unbelief in your heart, it's hard to sing. So when Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, um, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but if you're not living that, it's hard to sing. And when the scripture says that we should deny ourselves in Luke 9, a daily take up our cross and follow Christ, but you're not doing that, it's, you'll lose your song is what, what'll happen. You won't be able to sing. And, and if you have forgotten that James 1, uh, 27 says that pure and undefiled religion before the Father is this, to visit the, the, the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. If you're not living that, you lose your song. That's why when you go into churches, unbelieving churches with mostly empty seats, and when you go inside and hear the singing, they're hardly singing at all. Why? Because you can't sing through unbelief. You don't sing. And if you persist in your unbelief, you get to bitterness. People who know the truth and turn from it willfully become bitter. And as they lean on other crutches that fail them, you wish the crash of their consequences would quickly turn them back to Christ. But hearts are stubborn and time seems in our youth to go on indefinitely. And so people become bitterness. A root of bitterness springs up. If you're not careful, it defiles many people. And bitter people are persistently unbelieving people who won't do what the scripture says. And trust me when I tell you, they're not singing very much. Of course, where does that go? Unbelief leads to bitterness and bitterness leads to bondage. Would you do this? Would you just keep your finger for a second in Psalm 98 and turn a little to the right to Psalm 137, a Psalm I've never mentioned as far as I know in any service at harvest ever. Psalm 137 speaks of the children of Israel who had traced the cycle of unbelief and bitterness and now they're in captivity, they're living in bondage. I want you to see this, look at your Bible. Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. It's just awful to think of God's people in slavery, but there they were. We remembered Zion, see it? Zion is a poetic name for Jerusalem. They remembered home. They remembered where their heart was, and they weren't there. On the willows there in slavery and bondage, we hung up our lyres. Someone has said that a lyre is like a harpy guitar kind of thing. I'm trying to remember who that was. And so the instrument of worship, we won't even... Sing, are you kidding me? We hung our harps, have you heard this phrase, on willows. That's where it comes from. They didn't want to sing. Not there at the end of the unbelief, bitterness, bondage road. For there are captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And they answered so incredibly, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And maybe this Christmas you find yourself in a foreign land, not geographically, but your heart's been far from God. And maybe you've even found your way into church on one of our campuses this morning and you listen to the people as they sing and you find yourself growing skeptical. It's, it's the gifted worship leader that's making that happen. It's, it's, it's the music that's bringing forth the worship from these people, and you couldn't be more wrong. These are people, these are people who have been set free 
from unbelief and bitterness and bondage. These are people who have seen the yoke broken. And because they've seen it, they don't need some person up at the front to get them to sing. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Prepare to welcome the Lord our king. And then joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy, employing every possible instrument. Why? Because he defeats every enemy. He defeats every enemy. It says in Psalm 98, verse 7, let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Please remember that the world is broken. Just like we are marred by sin and we are inclined to things that are harmful to us and must lean into and and volitionally take hold of things that are right and true and eternal. So the world itself is, well, I can't say it better than Romans 8 says it. Romans 8, 18 says... For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning. See that on the news every night? I mean, this thing doesn't work right. It just flat out doesn't work right, and cars are floating down the street, and things are exploding, and wasn't sp- everyone say, it wasn't supposed to be like that. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them it wasn't supposed to be like that. And just like sinners need to be saved, the creation needs to be redeemed. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, eagerly awaiting for the adoption of sons. For some of you, I know it's been a very long year, You have prayers that aren't answered yet. You have disease that isn't healed yet. I prayed with a woman between the services who found out this week she has breast cancer. And I believe the Lord will heal her. But she has that obviously on her mind. Some of you have a relationship that isn't restored yet. Some of you have a prodigal that isn't home yet. I was reading this week in Habakkuk. It is not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing. Some of you feel like you've worked and worked and worked and worked and worked all year and you don't have to show for it what you thought you'd have. But Habakkuk goes on to predict that one day the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's coming. It's coming. Before 2,000 years ago, they had nothing. We have the whole first advent, which is shouting to us, everything you don't have yet is promised in what you already have. The rest of Christmas... Here's the verse in the Christmas carol no one ever sings. We're going to sing it in a minute. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Every time you see a tornado or an earthquake or a volcano and people running for their lives and some of them not making it, just think to yourself, the, the creation itself is subjected to futility, but subjected in hope. One of the things the first Christmas promised, but we don't have the rest of Christmas yet. We don't have the final Christmas. We don't have the last Christmas. But every time we think about that baby in the manger, we're like, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. It's coming. Listen to this third. 
we don't sing. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Every place on the face of the earth where sin has damaged what Almighty God created in perfect beauty, it's going to get fixed. It's going to get fixed. It's going to be more awesome than we can imagine. And right now he's preparing the heavenly city and it's going to come down and the heaven and the earth are going to be recreated and we are going to live with him for all of eternity. This is the part. This is the reason why some of them think it's not about Christmas. But it really is about both. So clearly I see both. So finally this, because he defeats every enemy and then and will rule with righteous love. Will rule with righteous love. Psalm 98, 3. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. That's so awesome. And the final stanza of the carol. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. Now, that's not beautiful. I'm just going to say. And we want to be merciful. Making the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. That's not a fun day. You know, if, I, if me and you got into it about something, that's never going to happen. I love you dearly. But if we got into it and, and someone heard me saying to you, yeah, we'll prove it. Would that be a good time for us or, or not a good time? It's not so good, right? But the Lord is going to make the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. Do you know that the, British, the Roman Empire proved that pride and perversion will be your destruction? And the British Empire proved that greed and cruelty would be your downfall. And right now, the United States of America is in the process of proving both points. And let every, let God be proven true and every man a liar. He is making the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. Which side of that do you want to be on? thinking that anything is glorious other than him. Oh, thank God that the first Christmas promises the rest of Christmas. The first Christmas promises God with us, the rest of Christmas, us with God. The first Christmas Savior, the rest of Christmas King. First, forgiveness of sins, rest, freedom from sin. Now, waiting by faith. Someday, reward and face to face. Now we have hope. Someday we have heaven. Make a note of this. Everything we lack and long for at Christmas is promised in the Christmas we already have. Can't wait for the rest of Christmas. We have enough to wait by faith, to walk by faith.